This week on Brian Ross Investigates, the cloud over the Olympics. You just can't have a successful Olympic Games when the host is committing atrocity crimes. It's not possible. A focus on the treatment of the minority group, the Uyghurs, the mass detentions, torture, and forced separations the Chinese don't want athletes or journalists talking about. You can assume that your communications will be monitored, that spyware may be put in, that your room will be bugged. Plus, the mayor of San Jose, California, with a new law aimed at doing something about America's gun violence, the first of its kind requiring gun owners to take out liability insurance. The city passed a first of its kind nation gun law. Gun owners will have to pay an annual fee and keep liability insurance. And this week's winners and losers in the media. See if you agree with the choices made by the editors of Mediaite. The Holocaust isn't about race. From the studios of the Law and Crime Trial Network in New York City's Herald Square, this is Brian Ross Investigates. And good evening, and thank you for joining us, and welcome to our viewers on Facebook Live. I'm Brian Ross, joined, as always, by my colleague, Rhonda Schwartz. And Rhonda, we begin tonight with the dark cloud over the Winter Olympics, underway this week in China, as human rights groups decry the country's miserable human rights record, and journalists there find themselves unable to freely report what's going on, Rhonda. That's right, Brian. And the focus is on the Chinese, how the Chinese government has been treating a large ethnic minority group, the Uyghurs, something Chinese officials are hoping will get drowned out with all the pageantry and puffery that comes with the Olympics. The same government that is hosting those Olympics is also continuing to commit crimes against humanity targeting Uyghurs. And this includes mass arbitrary detention, torture, forced separations of families, including uh, very young children separated from their parents, uh, cultural persecution, and forced disappearances. Primarily located in the northwest Xinjiang province, more than 12 million Uyghurs live in China mostly Muslims. They have long been seen by the Chinese government as disloyal and as dangerous. Inside China's controversial internment camps, more than a million Uyghurs and others belonging to various Muslim minority groups are believed to be detained in the Xinjiang region. China calls them thought transformation camps built to prevent extremism from spreading, but reports indicate they're more like prisons. We've seen China's Muslim re-education camps the way the Chinese wanted us to see them on a tightly controlled tour earlier this year. And we've seen glimpses from leaked videos like this one. China says the camps stop Muslim Uyghurs from becoming extremists and offer free job training. But now an inside look in the Chinese government's own words. A leaked nine-page memo reads like a how-to manual, telling officials to strictly implement measures to prevent escape. That means 24-7 video surveillance, watchtowers, and double-locked doors. And this is how thoughts are transformed. Long hours of rote learning Chinese. The study of China's tightening restrictions on religion and the replacing of faith and cultural identity with a different loyalty. Uh, it's a different language, distinct religion, culture, uh, and the, the, the authorities have perceived this as evidence of separatism. Human Rights Watch and other groups are hoping the attention on the Olympic Games will force action. Some of the good steps would be uh, certainly the International Olympic Committee uh, fulfilling its obligations to defend in human rights. The same with the top sponsors, which includes a number of big American companies like Coke and Intel and Visa. Most important, what we would like uh, to see is a global audience understand that behind all of the pomp and the pageantry and what will undoubtedly be extraordinary athletic performances you know, is a government that is highly repressive and committing gross systemic violations that, if committed by pretty much any other government in the world, would already be well under investigation with a view towards prosecutions. American athletes will be in China in large numbers, but citing the human rights issues, the United States is carrying out a kind of diplomatic boycott, 
No senior U.S. official will be present for the games. The Biden administration will not send any diplomatic or official representation to the Beijing 2022 Winter Olympics and Paralympic Games, given the PRC's ongoing genocide and crimes against uh, humanity in Xinjiang and other human rights abuses. The athletes on Team USA have our full support. We will be behind them 100 percent as we cheer them on from home. We will not be contributing to the fanfare of the games. U.S. diplomatic or official representation would treat these games as business as usual in the face of the PRC's egregious human rights abuses and atrocities in Xinjiang. And we simply can't do that. The goal here really is not to punish the athletes. They don't have a say uh, in where they compete. But I think we need to look very carefully at the complete moral bankruptcy of the IOC and its unwillingness to uphold even its own human rights standards with respect to host cities. You know, the Chinese government refused to fulfill the human rights commitments it made to get the 2008 Olympics. So the fact that the IOC gave it another round of the games without seeking improvements uh, is pretty problematic. But China has taken steps to prevent any public criticism from athletes or journalists. You know, just last week, a very senior member of the Chinese Olympic Organizing Committee uh, made very clear that athletes and support staff and coaches who spoke, in his words, in contravention of Chinese laws and regulations, which are incredibly vague on free speech, and in violation of, quote, the Olympic spirit, also very vague, would face certain punishment. And those are his words, certain punishment. Uh, and that has sent a real chill. You just can't have a successful Olympic Games when the host is committing atrocity crimes. It's not possible. We're joined now by John Powers, veteran Boston Globe sports reporter who has covered every Olympic for the last 22 years. But John, you're not going to China this year. Why not? Uh, we wanted to go. We went to Tokyo last summer in spite of COVID. But the barriers this time in a number of ways just argued against it. Uh, barriers to getting into the country, uh, what we would be able to do while we're there, the closed loop, quote unquote, where you're not allowed to be out in the city, uh, concerns about um, government surveillance, uh, all of it added up to, um, we probably were as better off or no worse off covering the games from here. And you're not the only uh, reporter or journalist not to be going. NBC, for instance, is doing his broadcast. Uh, their announcers are gonna be in Connecticut. Yep, and I think ESPN is doing the same. And John, is it fair to say that as a journalist, you felt you really couldn't do your job the way you'd like to because of restrictions? You couldn't be out in the streets in Not China at all. at all? No, as a matter of fact, you were going to be followed. Uh, and because we have iPhones that they, that they know about, they could trace you. We were also told many of the people who are going have been told bring disposable iPhones and disposable laptops because you can assume that your communications will be monitored, that spyware may be put in, that your room will be bugged. Uh, so we talked to lawyers and other experts and they said, you can assume that. Actually, that's the same advice that the US Olympic uh, on Paralympic, Paralympic Committee gave the athletes. Don't bring your own stuff. Do you think the Chinese are concerned you would look at the issues involving their human rights records? I think so. Uh, I know that the athletes have certainly been told fairly recently that you can protest if it's within the Olympic spirit, as long as you don't criticize Chinese policy. So the, uh, the human rights organizations have warned American athletes, especially, don't say anything over there. You know, uh, so I think there is a chilling aspect to this that we have not seen at any other games ever. John Powers, I want to thank you so much for being with us. We'll read your coverage in the Boston Globe and do the best you can from a distance. Thanks so much. You know, we we are on to Paris. We asked officials at the Chinese embassy in Washington to appear on our program tonight, but we never heard back. Up next, we'll be joined by the mayor of San Jose, California, with a first-of-its-kind novel approach to this country's out-of-control gun violence. Can it get past the Second Amendment? You're watching Brian Ross Investigates on the Law and Crime Trial Network. Hi, this is Dan Abrams with exciting news for all of our Law & Crime followers on YouTube. You can now get the live Law & Crime Network with YouTube TV for all of your daily live trial coverage, legal news, expert analysis, and original true crime programs. 
subscribe to YouTube TV today, and then locate Law & Crime in the channel guide. And for only $1.99 a month, you can add the network to your bundle. Watch Law & Crime every day with YouTube TV. We put you in the jury box. We turn now to this country's continued failure to find a solution to the rampage of gun violence here. But now city officials in San Jose, California, think they have found a novel solution that can pass muster with the Second Amendment and could be used as a template across the country, requiring gun owners to buy liability insurance as a way to push for the safer handling of their weapons. We begin with breaking news. Own a gun in San Jose and you will need insurance. In the past 30 minutes, the city passed a first of its kind nation gun law. Gun owners will have to pay an annual fee and keep liability insurance. So to learn more about this, we're joined now by the mayor of San Jose, Sam Licardo. Mr. Mayor, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, how will this legislation work? How will it will prevent gun violence? Brian, good to be with you. Uh, there are two components to this ordinance. One would require every gun owner to have insurance, uh, just as any driver needs to have insurance to drive in any state. Uh, the, the second would require all gun owners in our city to pay a small fee, $25 annually. That would be paid to a nonprofit foundation which would invest those dollars in gun violence prevention strategies, uh, evidence-based approaches uh, ranging from suicide prevention and mental health uh, to domestic violence reduction and, uh, and, and gun safety classes. Uh, we think by making these strategic investments, particularly targeting uh, those residents who live in homes in which a gun is owned, uh, that's the best way to get at the tremendous risk involved in gun ownership in this country. Mayor Licardo, last May there was a terrible shooting in San Jose, nine people killed, uh, plus a tenth of the gunman. Would this legislation in any way prevent that from happening? Well, I can't pretend to know uh, that we could prevent a horrible tragedy. Uh, we know that no ordinance is going to magically fall, make, a, make a gun fall out of the hands of, a, uh, of someone who is on a rampage who is intent on causing mass harm like that. Uh, but we'd certainly like to have the chance if we could roll back the tape a year or two years to be able to have mental health services provided to somebody who owns a gun who's clearly having issues, as this gunman in particular had palpable evidence of, of very serious mental health issues that his coworkers and, in fact, even the U.S. Customs Service observed. You know, this is something that we don't have resources for. Like most cities, we don't actually run the health departments in our counties. Uh, we'd love to be able to have resources to invest in those kinds of interventions. Mayor Licardo, a question for you from Rhonda Schwartz. Rhonda? Gun rights groups have said this is absolutely a preposterous idea, and they're promising to sue you, Mayor. What do you make of their reaction, and how are you going to go up against that? Well, the reaction is more or less what we anticipated. Uh, we've had a lawsuit already. Uh, we know that to file a lawsuit in this country means exercising your Seventh Amendment rights, and you have to pay a fee at the courthouse steps to file that complaint. Uh, similarly, for a newspaper to publish a story about this event, uh, many of those newspapers pay taxes, and that has been upheld uh, by the Supreme Court. Uh, and the mere fact that it's a constitutional right doesn't mean it can't be regulated or there can't be a fee that attaches. And the question is whether we're creating barriers uh, that are uh, too burdensome in the exercise of that right. I'm confident this is a very, very modest uh, fee and, and certainly not going to impair anyone from exercising the constitutional rights in this country. You know, we, we certainly have a Second Amendment that protects the right of every American to own and possess a gun, uh, but it doesn't require every taxpayer to subsidize. Uh, the exercise of that right. And right now, that's exactly what we're doing. In California, we're spending $1.4 billion on the public cost of responding to gun harm. Mr. Mayor, if you are successful here, this uphold is upheld by the courts, this could be a template for the rest of the country. Well, we hope that other cities and states will, in fact, engage in this kind of policy. Uh, we want insurance companies to get involved because we see how effective that has been in reducing deaths, for example, with regard to auto accidents. Uh, over five decades, we've seen 
80% drop in auto-related fatalities because people have been encouraged to buy cars with analog brakes or, or airbags. And we have good driver safety discounts. Uh, you know, through utilizing uh, uh, risk-adjusted premiums, insurance companies can encourage safer behavior. And we need that in a country with four and a half million children that live in a home where a gun is kept unlocked and loaded. And we know that gun safes and trigger locks and gun safety classes could go a long way to making those homes much safer and preventing a lot of harm. With so many guns in this country, you're up against a huge task in trying to get gun safety laws passed. You're right. We have a country with more than 300 million guns, and we're not going to magically make everyone safe with any ordinance or statute. What we're hoping is to make gun ownership safer. We're not going to take guns away from anyone. No one has to fear of big bad government getting involved here. What we're trying to do is make strategic investments with public money that can reduce harm uh, and encourage the private sector in the form of insurance companies to incentivize safer behavior. All right. Mayor San Licardo, San Jose, California, thank you so much for being with us here this evening. It's great to be with you, Brian. Thank you. All right. We asked the National Association of Gun Rights to have someone appear here tonight with the mayor, but we did not hear back from them. Well, up next, this week's winners and losers, two losers in the media, two very big losers. You're watching Brian Ross Investigates on the Law and Crime Trial Network. Time now for this week's winners and losers in the media, as chosen by the editors of Mediaite. And we're joined by Aidan McLaughlin, who's the editor-in-chief of Mediaite, which, like the Law and Crime Trial Network, is part of the Dan Abrams Media Group. And this week, Aidan, two losers and no winners. The first big loser, Jeff Zucker at CNN, out, abruptly resigning. What's behind right. all this? It's been that kind of week, Brian. Um, Jeff Zucker uh, was uh, resigned today. Uh, he was actually pushed out of CNN, a network he has run since 2013. Uh, now, just to give you a little glimpse inside CNN, Jeff Zucker is beloved by almost everyone who works at CNN. Uh, and you saw a series of, of uh, sort of fond notes pour out from anchors and producers, writers at CNN, uh, who are really sad to see this turn of events. Um, now, what happened is uh, Jeff Zucker resigned uh, this morning, he announced his resignation, and he said that the reason he was resigning is because he had a relationship with Alison Gollist, who is uh, an EVP uh, at CNN and is also the chief marketing officer of the network. Uh, now, they've had that relationship for uh, more than a year, they said now, since it's, they said it started in the pandemic. Uh, but they've worked together since uh, the, they both worked at NBC back in 2012. So the relationship is, has been going on for, for quite a while now. They said that the reason that uh, Zucker was resigning is because he had, did not disclose that he was in this relationship with Alan, Alison Gallist, which you're supposed to do because they're colleagues. Um, now, that was the reason he said he was resigning. I know people at CNN uh, had issues with that. Alison Camerata, who's a host on the network, uh, she said she didn't understand why he was resigning over a consensual relationship just because he didn't disclose it to HR. Um, so I suspect there's, there's a little bit more to this story. We know that uh, Jason Kilar, who is the head of Warner Media, which is CNN's current parent company, has issues, his own issues with uh, uh, Jeff Zucker, and that Jason Kilar was the one who asked for Jeff Zucker's uh, resignation and said that he would be terminated if Jeff Zucker didn't announce it himself. Uh, that's Brian Stelter of CNN who reported that. Um, so I think, I suspect in the coming days, we'll get a little bit more clarity on why Jeff Zucker so abruptly resigned, um, but it was clearly not his decision to do so. And Aiden, this seems to be more fallout from the firing of Chris Cuomo by Jeff Zucker. That's right. That's another sort of wild element of this. Chris Cuomo, who was fired for, uh, by CNN in December uh, because he was advising his brother, uh, the former New York governor, on his sexual harassment scandal, um, during the investigation that CNN uh, had, had uh, declared into that, uh, into that scandal within its own network, uh, Jeff Zucker was asked by the lawyers that CNN had hired for that investigation uh, whether or not he was in this relationship with Alison Gallist. 
And that's when he disclosed it. And uh, that's when Jason Kilar uh, asked for his resignation. So it, it all trails back to uh, Andrew Cuomo's sex scandal, um, which is truly like a pretty remarkable domino effect to have there. What a blast radius, as Ben Smith of The New York Times said. Finally, let's go to your second loser, Whoopi Goldberg of ABC's The View, who was suspended for two weeks for these comments about the Holocaust. The Holocaust isn't about race. No. No, it's well, not about maybe race. Maybe it is. Well, no, it's Jews about a different race. But it's it's not about race. It's not about well, race. What is it about? Because you, it's about man's inhumanity to man. Well, she was widely criticized for that. Uh, went on the Stephen Colbert show and apologized. Said the same thing on the View. But that wasn't enough for ABC, which uh, put her on a two-week suspension. That's right. Uh, so after those comments, there was a huge public backlash. Uh, Whoopi Goldberg issued a, a pretty lengthy apology. Uh, then uh, the head of the Anti-Defamation League appeared on The View um, to basically give the ladies of The View a, a lesson in uh, the Holocaust and uh, why it was indeed very much about race. Um, that still wasn't enough for ABC. Uh, Kim Godwin, who is the current uh, president of the network, announced that she, uh, that Whoopi Goldberg was being suspended for two weeks uh, so that she could learn. Um, I think it was sort of an odd decision to suspend her for two weeks. It's something the network sort of has to answer for now. Um, I, I don't know that, that there was that much of a public demand for it. Usually in these situations, networks are caving to a big public demand that they um, sort of punish a host for saying something controversial. In this case, most people, uh, at least that I saw in the pundit class, uh, were a little bit baffled that Whoopi Goldberg was being uh, suspended because there's, there's not much to investigate here. Um, it's pretty much tied up. But you know, I think this this case is is yet another one um, in the and uh, what I think is a, is an issue with the view as a show, which is that uh, there are people like Whoopi Goldberg, who is an actor um, from Hollywood, who's commenting on issues of great importance like the Holocaust that requires a deep historical perspective to really get right. Um, it's sort of like Joe Rogan, uh, you know, talking about COVID um, and vaccines uh, without having any actual expertise in it. Um, so, you know, uh, you have these hosts on air all day um, talking live. Uh, they're going to make mistakes like this, and I think this is a good example of it. All right, indeed. We'll see what Whoopi says about this, whether she takes it. Aiden, thanks so much for being with us tonight. Very much appreciated. Thanks to all of you for joining us. That's our program for tonight. We'll see you back here again next week.